Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Hassan with another episode of the Influence Continuum. And I've been looking forward to today's talk with two scholars, uh, people that I respect so very much. Uh, I'd like to introduce Frederick Clarkson first. Uh, Fred has written about politics and religion for four decades, and he interviewed me four decades ago when I got out of the Moonies, I will add. Uh, his work has appeared in a wide range of publications from Mother Jones, Church and State, Ms. Magazine, Christian Science Monitor, Religion Dispatches. He's worked as an investigative editor, Planned Parenthood Fed Federation of America, uh, communications director at the Institute for Democracy Studies, co-founded the group blog Talk to Action. He's the author, co-author, and editor of several books, including Dispatches from the Religious Left, The Future of Faith and Politics in America, and Eternal Hostility, The Struggle Between Theocracy and Democracy. He's currently the Senior Research Analyst at the Political Research Associates, which is a progressive think tank in Somerville, Massachusetts. And I just want to credit Frederick helped me so much when I was researching the cult of Trump. And that term is now worldwide, cult of Trump, cult of Trump. Uh, and I thank you, uh, Frederick, because you really educated me as well as helped to edit some of my writing to make sure it was correct. So, um, and we have done previous interviews. If you like this one and you want to check out previous ones on Freedom of Mind, please do. And distinguished scholar, uh, Andre Gagne, who I've had the pleasure to interview also. Andre Gagne is a full professor and chair of the Department of Theological Studies. I'm going to ask you, Andre, to explain your conjoint PhD is from? Université Catholique de Louvain, that's in Belgium, yes. uh, with uh, L'Université de Montréal. Fantastic. So you are uh, a former pastor of a new apostolic reformation group when we first met, but you have gone on to uh, research and, and teach about this. You, I will also add that in 2023, you were appointed as a member of the National Expert Committee on Countering Radicalization to Violence with Public Safety Canada. You're also a member of the Center for the Study of Learning and Performance in Concordia, which is a university where you teach, and a research associate with this. Uh oh, I'm going to butcher it. <laughs> Can I ask you to say yeah, the French? It's, a, it's essentially a center for the study of religion in the contemporary world. Yeah, so, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> You've been interviewed over 300 times in a million media outlets New York Times, Washington Post, Guardian. Uh, New York Times Literary Supplement, New Republic. You're a scholar, and I want to uh, do this because you have a new translation of the original French publication. It's called American <laughs> Evangelicals for Trump, Dominion, Spiritual Warfare, and the End Times. That's now published in English, and thank you for holding it up to Frederick. We got we got two plugs for your book, Andre. So it's 2024. We're in election year. It's not just elections in the United States, but all over the world. And the phenomenon you both study is a worldwide phenomenon. So it's of great interest. And we hope to get people all over the world listening to today's talk. And with that, I'll ask Frederick, if you don't mind, uh, set the table for what we're dealing with, and then we can dive into the scholarship of Andre uh, with the theology and such. Well, sure, just in a, in a very broad sense, uh, we're probably talking about something that most people have never heard of. Yes. The Apostolic Reformation. What in the world is that? And at least the way I've written about it, it's the cutting edge of, uh, of the Christian right these days. Mm -hmm. And how'd that happen? Well, the uh, the Pentecostal and Charismatic movement, which Andre can talk about in greater detail, is you know is the second largest grouping of Christianity in the world, and probably the only significant growth sector, you know, as including in the United States. So people who aren't familiar with Pentecostals and Charismatics, you can see their characteristic worship style of having hands in the air, sometimes palms raised, praying in tongues, uh, things that are very unusual to many other Christians, but nevertheless are. are, are 
a central cultural force. That said, they've got the this movement uh, of the New Apostolic Reformation is very politicized. Once upon a time, Pentecostals were not much political at all. They were uh, uh, been basically on the political sidelines since the Scopes trials. But through a theolo- series of theological changes, they've become more political and more theocratic in their orientation. Mm. At the same time, politically active as a central feature of the Christian right. They become very important and visible to us because when we see religious leaders laying hands on Donald Trump in the Oval Office, those famous pictures, yep. most of them are NAR apostles. His spiritual advisor, right, going back since before he was president, is Paula White Kane, who is an apostle. And, uh, you know, in her moment, <clears throat> one of the most prominent female religious leaders in the world, who has the ear of the president of the United States, and is still leading, you know, uh, evangelicals for Trump in his re-election effort to this day. So people who haven't heard of it should feel like they're being given a great disservice mm. by the political community, you know, across a wide spectrum, and the media that has simply saying, well, they're a bunch of white evangelicals. Well, it's more complicated than that. And uh, I think it's really, we, we owe it to ourselves and to democracy to really try to come to grips with this. It's eat your broccoli time as far as the New Apostolic Reformation is concerned. Yeah, and I, I'm going to say as uh, a, uh, a Jew, a progressive Jew, my understanding of Christianity over the decades was that you have a re- relationship to Jesus uh, and not to an, a living person who claims to be an apostle or a prophet who gets direct revelations and your faith and obedience is to that person because you're so afraid of demonic possession that they cover you and protect you from these demons. And that resonates with my time in the Moonies, where I was shown the exorcist and told the demons were possessing anyone who had doubts about following Moon, the Messiah, 100%. So I just wanted to shape that. And I'll say one more thing and then go to Andre. And that is the Christians that I know and hang out with they're not about money and politics and power. In fact, they decry uh, those prosperity ministers who say, give me money and God will bless you, you know, tenfold, put it on your credit card. And they have mansions and yachts and corporate jets. So there's a very big difference between being humble and poor and taking care of the, you know, immigrants and the, and the sick versus we need to take over the world and take over politics. So I just wanted to insert, forgive me, Andre Gagne, yes. please share. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so much, uh, Steve, for uh, this invitation. Uh, had the pleasure to be on your uh, show several times. Uh, yeah, and, and thank you for this opportunity to talk about this uh, new uh, book, which is new up to a certain extent, because uh, just to contextualize this uh, very briefly, uh, in 2020, I had published a French version of this book, um, and uh, it sold pretty well. You know, people in the Francophone world, especially Europe, were very intrigued with uh, neo-charismatic Pentecostals, like I call them in my book, and especially the new apostolic reformation and they were wondering what was happening in the US you know the relationship between between religion and politics because you know there's a lot of secular uh people in France for example that don't understand this uh, close proximity between uh, uh faith and politics so it was intriguing for them and uh, it was great uh, but uh, some Americans that do read French uh were uh were kind of uh insistent on saying you should get this book translated. And uh, so eventually through a you know bunch of uh, uh, circumstances and connections, we did get the book translated, but the book is slightly different than the French version, where I add an important preface to the book, trying to explain certain things that I hadn't uh, sufficiently unpacked in the French edition. And I also added an epilogue, which is the after 2020 election. So, you know, the Trump political legacies. Very important. And what's important in that book is 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 introducing what what Fred was talking about. Uh, people are very uh, familiar with evangelicals in general, but there's a strand of evangelicalism 
uh, that is often labeled as either uh, neo-charismatic or neo-Pentecostal or Pentecostal that people don't know as much. And I do unpack that because I, I don't focus on evangelicals in general in my book. I look at the neo-charismatic Pentecostals close to Trump and to political power. And then I frame this in the context of a movement or at least a way of understanding uh, apostolic governance in churches and in the world uh, and the influence of apostles and prophets, a way of conceptualizing that that has emerged with this idea of the new apostolic reformation. And what's very important for us, and I, I think Fred uh, is something that, that for Fred is also very important, is what do we mean by that? Because there's a lot of people, uh, there's a, a renewed interest up to a certain extent in, um, in American journalism, uh, where we see uh, references to the New Apostolic Reformation as something, you know, that people are discovering. And there's all sorts of definitions uh, to try to make sense of that. And there are good scholars that are working on that uh, and have maybe a, a slightly different perspective than the one that I speak of in my book. But for me, what was very uh, significant and important was to go back to the primary sources, meaning reading C. Peter Wagner, who is actually credited with coining this term, New Apostolic Reformation. Mm -hmm. But what I explain in the preface is that C. Peter Wagner did not invent this. And it, it, he did not invent this movement that we now call the New Apostolic Reformation. He labeled something that he already saw as existing. You know, C. Peter Wagner was a missiologist, was a theologian who worked at Fuller Theological Seminary for over 30 years. He had been uh, himself a missionary in Bolivia for several years, and he was very much interested in church growth and church growth across the world. How come certain churches grow and others don't? And what he realized is that most of the churches that grew were types of churches that we can label as charismatically leaning, where with strong leaders uh, that function a bit like CEOs <laughs> more than pastors, you see? Uh, they are literally religious entrepreneurs, uh, religious managers. And they bring forth and they make their churches grow, eh? And they, and they establish all sorts of, you know, uh, you know, very loosely tied networks amongst similar uh, types of groups and churches and leaders that share common ideas. Mm -hmm. And for him, this move that for him started in 1900, you see, it started at the beginning of the 20th century and he identifies, and I say this in my preface, he identifies specific moves throughout the 20th century, which he calls components of the NAR, components of the New Apostolic Reformation, and he says in 2001, America lived its second apostolic age. And this is where he starts really emphasizing this idea of, oh, this worldwide movement, new apostolic reformation that we're going to call it, and it's going to focus on apostolic governance and how churches now need to be run. And that will eventually not just affect churches, but affects society in general and their view of politics. Right. And just to clarify, when you use the term charismatic, is yeah. it correct to say speaking in tongues? Okay. That's more, it's more than that. Though. Okay. Please because explain. Speaking, yeah. Because this, you know, when we talk about charismatic or Pentecostal or things like that, essentially what we, we talk about are people that emphasize the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And they adhere to what is called in the Bible, the gifts of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, the gifts of the Spirit are supernatural manifestations and abilities that Christians are given by the Holy Spirit in order to build and edify the body of Christ, in order to build the church. And amongst those gifts, there is, of course, the gift of speaking in tongues and the interpretation of tongues. But there are other gifts like prophecy, healing, miracles, uh, the power to 
discern evil spirits, exorcisms, and, and, and things like that. So when we talk about charismatics slash Pentecostals, they have a propensity towards this idea of spiritual gifts. Okay, so it's not just speaking in tongues. I appreciate okay? that clarification. And can I ask a stupid question maybe? And that is, do they look down on the Catholic Church and other mainstream Christian groups um, in their it's, outlook and their yeah. practice? The thing is, when we talk about uh, the power or the, the experience of the spirit, that has also extended itself to Catholic groups. See, you see, see, like in the 60s, we had the charismatic renewal. So the charismatic renewal, you had amongst that, you had major mainline denominations like Catholics and Episcopalians and Methodists and all of that experience, in a sense, the Pentecostal experience of Azusa Street. You see, it, at the beginning of the 20th century, this the speaking in tongues and the gift and and an openness to the gift of the of the gifts of the spirit. So I'm now. I'm, so they're not necessarily uh, looking down on other denominations, but often what they will say, people in the in this in this kind of environment, they will say, "You are a Christian, but you are you do not have the fullness." of the spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay? You need to experience the fullness of the spirit and that comes through a realization that God gives spiritual gifts, comes through the notion or the idea of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and so on. So they look down in, in an implied way. One more quick question yeah. and then to you Fred. There. I think oh, I, please. I think you're being too kind. <laughs> Go ahead. Andre, the, uh, uh, the 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 new apostolic leaders who we're talking about. Yeah. Um uh, you know, uh, I don't think it's a question of looking down. It's actually recognizing that these other people who are not filled with the Spirit, right, and not going in these theological directions are not really Christians, right? That was my and, understanding. Uh, and, and, and that there are political implications for that. So if you're, if you're a, a progressive Catholic priest, you know, you're not really a Christian. If you're if you're a pro-choice, pro-marriage uh, equality Protestant, you're not really a Christian. That's and what the, I thought. And, and as they seek, you know, a greater role in government, the, and uh, and they and they you redefine religious freedom in terms of well, religious freedom for what we want to do, but not necessarily what you want to do. It begins to have political implications that erode all notions of religious pluralism and separation of church and state. As, uh, as foundational aspects of society. And I'll say one other thing, as Andre sort of touched on this, and that's the, uh, when we talk about apostolic governance in the church, what are we talking about here? Uh, it's, the, it's the role of, say, that 2,000 years of Christian institution building and leadership went in the wrong direction. Yeah. That, uh, the, that the book of Ephesians, which names, you know, apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and what am I missing, Andre? <laughs> Pastors. Pastors. <laughs> so you've taken these five functions taken together are what the leadership of the church needs to be, mm -hmm. you know, and that uh, uh, although some of them are called bishops, the role of bishop, as we would understand it, in mm. a Catholic and Protestant setting is, is not a real thing. A pope is not a real thing. These are, these are false offices. But understanding that they are on, they're, what they are doing is unraveling, right, and challenging, and uh, uh, decomposing where they can institutional Christianity as you understand it, which is a really big and difficult task. They're making it up as they go along, but nevertheless, that's the unambiguous goal of everything that they say. Yeah, yeah. Thank and, you. and it's and it's important to add that. What's, what Fred was saying is really focusing on new apostolic reformation because you'll have, you know, general Pentecostals or general charismatics that won't necessarily have that perspective in terms of other religions. But right. if we focus really on NAR and how even, uh, even C. Peter Wagner talked about the religious spirit, huh? uh, which is a, a, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, traditional, uh, type of way of doing Christianity, which is not really true Christianity in the end. In that sense, yes. But if we focus more on 
because my answer was more around the issue. Well, you're an of, academic, dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I get that you're a scholar. I respect that. I yeah, have yeah, a PhD. Yeah, I understand yeah, you have yeah, to speak yeah. in a certain way. I've no, kind no, of I don't yeah. share those burdens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it's just making those distinctions between right. NAR and maybe general Pentecostals, or, or that would not necessarily see. But the NAR themselves. folks have basically yeah. taken over the leadership of much yeah. of the evangelical exactly. world. It, exactly. You know, and. Uh, and ma many people who are not Pentecostal or charismatic are adopting aspects of, of yes. NAR ideas yes. and practices. Yes. Yep. And, uh, and we, we see it, for example, right, in some of our political leaders, like there's this guy, uh, Charlie Kirk, right, who an important uh, right-wing youth uh, mm -hmm. political organizer. He talks now about the seven mountains of dominion. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what I was going to ask yeah. you to talk about. Which was a very, which we'll talk about some more in just a sec, you know. But yeah. the idea that somebody who does not come out of this world is talking, taking a, a core theological and political idea and using it as an organizing tool going into the next elections is really quite uh, an astounding thing. It speaks to the, uh, to the the political and religious influence that this movement has beyond sort of the, 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 the little the, the contours of the, the categories that we have to use in order to explain these things. Mm. Yep. And I wanted to ask you to comment on the Heritage Foundation's Project 2025, was it? The 900 page tome where they're I have not read yet. So. If they if <laughs> they heard. take over the government, all the things they're going to do mm. and and uh, peel back the rights of everyone who isn't mm. part of their ill. Mm basically. Mm, yeah. And uh, scary because I, I, I haven't read the whole thing, but I heard someone talk who had read the whole thing and pulled yeah. out some of the high points or the low points, depending on your perspective. Yeah. So Andre, you want to do the, the, the Seven Mountains of Dominion? Yeah. In fact, uh, Kirk talked about that even in 2020. He was at a, a big, big rally with Rob McCoy at one point, and he uh, even went to the uh, CPAC and, and mentioned and said clearly, finally, we have a president that understands the Seven Mountains mandate. So very, like, like he's been talking about that since 2020. And that's a uh, Lance that, Wallnau concept or that term? Yeah, or? It's, it's actually something that Lance Wallnau popularized. Got this it. idea of Seven Mountains or Seven Spheres or Molders or whatever, that came out of reflections or at least you know, Bill Bright and Lauren Cunningham said they, they both had this kind of revelation in, in 1975 about, you know, society being kind of divided in seven molders or mountains or whatever. You want to name them? Uh, yeah, there's politics, education, uh, the family, arts and media, um, uh, business, business, uh, education. Ed, we, we said education, I think, uh, or education. And uh, religion, uh, the mountain of religion is one also. Uh, so essentially what the seven mount and, and, and Walnau is the, really the one that popularized that. He took that yeah. over and, and really made, made it his uh, marketing idea. Mm -hmm. But the seven mountains mandate is uh, really a mobilizing, it's, it's a strategy to mobilize Christians in order to fulfill the dominion mandate. Because the thing is, their political theology which I call a political theology of power, is dominionism, or what sometimes is referred to as dominion. And that, you know, Fred has provided a fantastic uh, definition on, of that, uh, where Christians are, it's a theocratic idea where Christians are called by God to exercise authority in all aspects of society by taking control of political and social and cultural institutions. That's dominion. And it's based on a particular reading and understanding of the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, about God uh, giving dominion to humankind. But that's a general creation mandate that they take for themselves. Yeah, see, an opposite and of Christian, what Jesus said about leave politics to the... Yeah, yeah. And, and Jesus, <laughs> when he was offered uh, by Satan in his uh, temptation... Uh, one of the temptations is, if you bow down to me, I will give you all these kingdoms. And Jesus refused the kingdoms, right. so which is very interesting. He refused to right. take over uh, the kingdoms. So, so, But what's interesting is that they have a political theology of power, which mm. is rooted in scripture. That's fine. 
But how do you get people to accomplish that? The seven mountain mandate is the goal. The seven mountain mandate becomes the mobilizing strategy to get things done. So it's in order to get people uh, in high places, Christians, influential Christians, especially those that embrace NAR ideas in top uh, leadership roles in politics or education or or the media or didn't or, Mark Bar and, Bar isn't Mark Barnett uh, at the top of the media thing? Didn't he do The Apprentice and Survivor and all these other things? Isn't he I, deeply involved? I know involved? that they saw. I know that they saw Trump at the top of that mountain when yeah. he was, <laughs> you know, leading that show and when he was mastering Twitter. Rob McCoy, a famous pastor of a Thousand Oaks in California, said of Trump, uh, you know, he occupied the, ma the mountain of, uh, of media uh, because he had uh, he was influential on Twitter. He occupied the mountain of business because the Trump name is, is known across the world. So who better than Trump to help Christians conquer the seven mountains mandate? So Trump becomes like a facilitator. This is why they they, 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 they liked Trump because he would facilitate their access to the mountains of culture. But don't we also have the problem with with these uh, apostles and prophets who claim to uh, talk to God, who prophesied that Trump would win 2020? And despite all evidence, they are still sticking with their prophecy and their followers are blind devotees of them, their apostle or their prophet. And so they will not accept the fact that even Trump appointees and every 40 plus judges said, nope, the election wasn't <laughs> stolen and Trump lost. Yeah. All of which is proof that the Democratic Party and liberals and and uh, the, the institutions of democracy that validated the election are all infused with demons and are the problem, right? <laughs> they are the problem, right? <sighs> if they don't deliver what uh, God and his prophets have said, they are the problem. Yeah. And this is really important to get our minds around this idea. This is reality for these folks. What we're talking about is, uh, is, is just another demonic delusion. Yeah, and what I say is they, yeah. in my opinion, as a mental health person, yeah. that's delusional, what they're telling their followers, because I was in a mind control cult run by a Korean who said he was 10 times greater than Jesus. So understanding going to the next elections, right, that these are folks who understand they're not up against, you know, a political candidate with whom they may differ religiously and politically. They're, they're, they're battling for the territory of the United States and the world, right, yeah. right. For, for, for building the kingdom. Institutions like insufficiently Christian or incorrect Christians are institutions that are in the way. Yeah. Right, uh, courts and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and and clerks in charge, county clerks in charge of elections. You know, they're in the way. Yeah, and their problems to be dealt with. You know, quite aside from electoral and democratic processes. Yeah, yeah. and Fred, yeah. It, you taught me when I was researching the cult of Trump about the Manhattan Declaration. Could you yes. could you explain to our listeners what that was about? Uh, well, sure, and some of our NAR figures fig figure into this, but it's a, it was a broad, uh, uh, well, for a long time, evangelicals and Catholics didn't get along politically and, uh, and, and religiously. And, uh, you know, pointing figures at each other about who's correct, but they, uh, but they shared a common uh, cultural agenda, mm. and they felt that, uh, uh, you know, increasing uh, separation of church and state, uh, increase of abortion access, marriage equality, and what they perceived as a as a as a culture that's oppressing their religious freedom was something that they shared in common. Mm -hmm. Decades of theological dialogue allowed them to finally uh, come up with this joint manifesto that was primarily authored by this Catholic uh, legal scholar Robert P. George, mm -hmm. and it basically uh, said that there are three things that they have in common: life marriage and religious freedom, and that they can build a, a common political agenda around that. And for the first time in the history of Christianity and in the political history of the United States, you had 
you know, 50 top Catholic prelates, Catholic, you know, cardinals and bishops and important theologians signing a common document with important evangelical leaders mm. and people like, and uh, political leaders like uh, Ralph Reed, mm. you know, and, and a smattering of, uh, of Orthodox. And so some 500 were the original <clears throat> signatories, well-known names, and they got some 500,000 other people to sign on to this. This became the operating agenda for the Christian right uh, be after whatever the, the year was, 2007, 2009, uh, 2009, and uh, <clears throat> you know, a year into the Obama administration. So you would see the websites of all the Christian right groups and even the, the, uh, the National Conference of Catholic Bishops change their websites to say, we're in favor of life, you know, traditional marriage and religious freedom, you know, in that order. Right. Which means That's against women's right to choose, against gay rights, and wanting to give them more power to discriminate against minorities or other religious perspectives. Mm -hmm. And just one last point of speak how powerful an idea this was and how unifying an idea it was. <clears throat> I'm old enough to remember Mitt Romney's acceptance speech at the 2012 Republican convention in his nomination for president, you know, three years after the beginning of the Manhattan Declaration. He went out of his way as a Mormon, right, whose who's, who's, uh, religious views are going to be suspect, mm. to say that he stood for life, marriage, and religious freedom. Mm. He knew exactly what he was saying and who he was saying it to. Yep. Yeah. So this is so vital. And I'm so frustrated, I'm sure you guys are too, with the media's ignorance about what's actually happening mm. and how our freedoms and our institutions are under assault. Mm. Uh, science is under assault. Experts are under assault. Democratic institutions, our whole judiciary uh, is getting remade mm. in the image of the uh, the right and, mm. and uh, libertarianism, not even mm. conservative, mm. but libertarianism mm. and nihilism. Mm. And, and what's what, what what's interesting um, is that at least media are starting to pick up a bit on the issue of new apostolic reformation, especially when we start thinking in terms of January 6th, uh, you know, in terms of spiritual warfare ideas. Uh, I have an entire chapter in, in this book uh, mm -hmm. that deals chapter three with the issue of spiritual warfare and uh, civil war. And, and um, it really unpacks what they mean by that. Because a lot of people think, oh, you know, demons, uh, you know, Paula White Cain praying uh, and, and taking authority and binding spirits. Uh, she, she's a nutcase. You know, that, a lot of people think it's just, these people that think like that, and that's it. And, and they're, they're probably all crazy. The thing is, people need to talk, take this very seriously because yes. it has political uh, consequences. When pa Paula Cain, for example, in, in 2021, was actually at the Amway Center during the... Uh, Which is a multi-level marketing cult that I criticize. Yeah, but, but where she was in front of 20,000 people, yeah. Trump was actually kicking off his re-election campaign. Mm. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting to see, uh, not in 2021, 2019, sorry, uh, when she was praying, uh, the way that she was praying, the type of prayers that she was emitting in front of 20,000 people about binding spirits and protecting uh, Donald Trump against the demonic networks that are going, that are coming against him. What she's doing, she's not just praying to God or praying against demonic forces, but she's also speaking to 20,000 people, you see, by labeling Trump's political adversaries as being under demonic influence. And, and, and you see, this is why when we talk about the Christian right, it's not the old Christian right. It's something completely different. And people think, oh, this is the old Christian right with the moral majority at the time. And it's not that. Now we're in a completely new paradigm of demonizing political adversary, adversaries, dehumanizing them in order to completely negate 
and, uh, their their political and influence. I'll add fourth generation warfare online on social media platforms where people are sleep deprived and they're getting these videos and messages eight hours a day reinforcing over and over and over again lies mm -hmm. that they then accept as truth because authority figures are saying it mm. they, you know and and they're mm. they're repeating the the big lie theory of uh, yeah. Goebbels and Hitler right yeah one thing I want to help with here that is you know as we start out with most people find this stuff crazy right and hard yeah. to understand and it's new to them and they can't Absolutely. believe that they didn't know about this before and is it really as important as these guys are saying and uh, you know how come I'm not seeing it in the media and these are all fair questions Fortunately, Andre's book, you know, is part as a partial answer to that. It's not just any book; it's a really thin book <laughs> yep. that is a, that's that's very accessible. You know, yes, it, it deals with stuff in a scholarly way, but it's an accessible language, you know, for an otherwise reasonably well-informed reader. So it's a primer. Yes. It's like you want to begin somewhere. You want to begin here. There's other great books on the Christian mm -hmm. right. We've talked about them on this on this podcast, but you know, begin here, begin with Andre's book, and it will probably give you the, the opening that you need. And, and Fred's book, Eternal Hostility, which is a quote from Jefferson, if I remember. Oh, uh, yeah. Share that quote, um, Fred, <laughs> of, oh, of your uh, book. The, it was, uh, the, the quote is from a letter that uh, Jefferson wrote to, uh, to a friend of his. It says, after the smear campaigns against him, you know, during the election of 1800, he was, they, people were so afraid in New England, they had, had to run and hide their Bibles because they afraid the agents of Jefferson were going to come and get them, right? And uh, so he said, I've sworn on the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. Mm. And... That quote is inscribed inside the rotunda of the Jefferson Memorial in, in Washington. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and a lot of the, the right-wingers, uh, well, we've got to go back to the founders, and we've got to go back to mm -hmm. the Constitution, but they, don't, they haven't read anything mm -hmm. that indicates that the founders are really clear about the abuse of power that could be wrought through by using religion. Uh, to to co-opt people's uh, ability to think for themselves and reason. And one of the lessons in my looking at this over over the years is that, you know, the uh, the religious right of the 18th century didn't like the Constitution when it was written, actively opposed its ratification, hmm. because Article Six says there will be you know no religious test for public office anywhere in the United States. No religious test. I mean, you can't. You don't have to be a Christian to hold public office. Well, that's right. So, but the religious right lost in the 18th century. But they've been trying to regroup and re, re uh, fight these battles ever since. There's always going to be a sector of society that's not going to accept the equality of other people's mm. views and religious and uh, religious ideas and institutions. And the idea of defending pluralism, the rights of everyone else, mm -hmm. even with people with whom we disagree religiously, politically, that's what the American experiment is, yeah. right? It's not something else, it's that. Yeah. And uh, unless we get that, unless we figure out how to defend, you know, each other's rights, you know, uh, under the law, you know, there's always going to be this this theocratic rump faction that's going to keep trying to regrow like a, like a recurrence of cancer, right? to undermine those very democratic values and institutions. Yep. This is the situation we're in, in in a way that's worse than any time in American history. Yeah, it's incredibly important. And I'll just add, people don't realize that the American you know, currency didn't have in God we trust uh, before 1952. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. was a, a, a religious political move. Mm -hmm. To, uh, yeah. to 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 insert God into our sure. in, into our money system, and Fred has been writing on this for a long, long time. So if he tells you there hasn't been a situation <laughs> that is as urgent as now, 
uh, I think we we need to really uh, take heed of that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And uh, Fred, I want to ask you just comment about Project Blitz because I remember over the years you were like, we got this plan. We have to do mm -hmm. Blitz Watch. We have to educate people. There's a plan to go into states and take over state governments and school boards. You knew that because you had the plan. But people were not <laughs> listening to you in, in the way that they needed to, in my opinion. Well, you know, a coalition of groups put together blitzwatch.org, and the website still exists, and we issue a, a periodic newsletter updating Project Blitz. But, but what was that? Uh, well, Project Blitz was a, uh, was a, a legislative manual, right, and a network of, state, of, of Christian rights state legislators across the country. And the genius of it is that, uh, is that they got together and said, well, you know, we've been trying all these various things across the country all this time. You know, what have we learned, you know, from our best successes and our worst failures? And uh, what's the distillation of that wisdom? What's the best practice and what's sort of the best generic uh, kind of legislation to put forward? And that's what the Project Blitz manual became. The, the, <laughs> what they have learned and uh, and taking it forward as a set of model legislation that people in what they call prayer caucuses and some 35 state legislatures, you know, would then shape according to the local uh, legislative need and circumstance and, and the politics of the occasion. It became a really important part of the legislative agenda, the Christian right, the ripple effects, you know, we're still seeing. But uh, there, the bill that was most popular and most introduced, and where it actually succeeded in a lot of states, was a bill requiring posting uh, posters or other displays of uh, In God We Trust in the public schools and other public buildings. Hmm. Yep. So, listen, uh, it's, it's 2024, uh, and there just seems to be ever-increasing uh, steps towards inducing chaos, uncertainty, fear, anxiety. A lot of people are overwhelmed. They're looking for what to do. Uh, and what we don't want them to do is tune out and play video games and binge watch movies. We want them to educate themselves and become active. So I'd like to ask, um, what do we do? Like I'm, I'm doing this podcast, but I'm hoping someone will be listening going, I need to learn more about this, getting Andre's book, getting Frederick's book. <laughs> but then, then what, what do we do? I'm going to ask you to start Fred and then <laughs> Andre. <laughs> well, you know, since since we, since we we've we've started out with this with the idea that there's a whole bunch of stuff that we don't know that we need to know. Yes, uh, that's where we begin. Begin with Andre's book, and you know, find like-minded people who share the same concerns. But my advice in that is that the goal is to find is to create a, a, enough common knowledge among one another, and enough common vocabulary among one another. You're going to hear a lot of stuff, right? right. Like, this is really important. There's this crazy guy over here, and there, everybody has a different name for everything, right? Mm. Yes. Stop that. <laughs> Just stop it, you know? Mm -hmm. Say, these are the terms we're going to use, and let's agree upon them so that we know what each other is talking about when we talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then we can point. develop some kind of strategy. Once we understand that there's this whole uh, organized movement that has a supernatural vision uh, of... of uh, Mm -hmm. uh, of, of political reality and are opposed to democratic institutions and people who hold to those values, then you could say, well, you know, we have this anti-democratic movement going on and we can begin to figure out how personally, you know, we, maybe we can relate to our neighbors and say, well, maybe I'm not really as demonic as you may think I am. So there's a personal element to it mm -hmm. and there's a political element too, unless you recognize that there's this, uh, uh, tremendous anti-democratic political force that's organizing itself. You're not going to figure out democratic ways to counter that. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and you have to know that there are people are never going to accept the outcomes. Yeah. How does a culture, do we deal with that? Yeah. You know, yeah. and if we really believe in, in democratic pluralism, you know, how do we really figure out what it means to defend the rights of our neighbors? Right. And uh, that's, uh, that's hard because as a culture, we've not been, 
uh, we, we've taken these things for granted tremendously. And yeah. figuring out that the time for taking things for granted is over is an important first step. Yeah, and, and taking and take, taking yeah, them ahead, very Andrew. yeah 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 very seriously. Stop just dismissing that these are what Fred was saying. These people are crazy. It's not going to happen. Uh, Trump is going to go to prison. Whatever. Stop that. Focus on learning. But also, what I what we see is that uh, journalism shapes a lot the public opinion. And, and uh, this is why we are doing this. This is why my book, I think, is, is accessible. This, okay, it's like academic, but it's accessible. Fred and I have been writing a lot on the New Apostolic Reformation. We've created pieces to kind of uh, reporter's guides on how to define certain terms, uh, how we use them, uh, labeling things correctly, uh, making sure that we get the language right, these are important things because, you know, like Fred was saying, we're going to hear stuff left and right. People using spiritual warfare terms don't understand what they mean. Right. That has happened throughout the first Trump presidency. You remember the the, the uh, satanic preg pregnancies <laughs> of, of Paula White Kane and how people got that wrong? Yeah. I explained that in the book. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and when you do that and when you... When you get things wrong, you make a case for them. You yeah. see, you play into their hands and saying, you see, they don't understand what we're talking about. They're persecuting us and so on. Right. So let's get the, the story right yep. and talk about it and people take yes. it seriously. So I want to amplify your point and say, you guys need to do media training. And I like to believe my yeah. work studying brainwashing and mind control and my influence continuum and bite model is part of that conversation mm -hmm. to help people identify this is ethical influence. Mm -hmm. These are the criteria. This is unethical influence. This is, you know, creating dependent, obedient pseudo identities. Um, and the good news is a lot of people are leaving these extremist groups and some of them want to share their story, and these yeah. need to be amplified, and that's what I'm trying to do. I've interviewed Alva Johnson, um, Rich Logis, Pam Hemphill, who was uh, arrested at January 6th and served two months. I'm trying to amplify the voices of people who've exited this bubble. And then I also want to just comment that it seems to me that the the uh, Cokes and the fossil fuel uh, countries, Putin especially, uh, they don't want regulation to stop global warming. They've been doing the disinformation campaign for 50 years using my former cult, the Moonies and the Washington Times, as the major disinformation uh, agency. Um, we need to name the bad actors that have agendas, and it's not just religious agendas, but money and power uh, agendas. But we also, I believe, need to go after billionaires, many of whom have been co-opted to believe in libertarianism and Ayn Randianism, selfishness is good and altruism is evil and, you know, just agents of foreign governments who've been paid off or blackmailed. We need to understand there's a war going on here to destroy the United States of America and freedom around the world for everyone. Mm. And it's not just here. Yeah. Yeah. I should add two things in that regard. One is that uh, we, we've talked a great deal about Donald Trump and the NAR, but uh, I recall, you know, before the last election, you know, a, a group of apostles on, on what they call a prayer call, right? You know, praying for uh, for various things, and they were praying not only for uh, for the election of Donald Trump, but of Netanyahu and Bolsonaro in Brazil, with whom they also have profound relationships. Mm. Yes, mm. and so it's important to see that the the it's not, and it's just just prayer. There's actors on the ground in these countries mm. as well as mm. others. These were just the focus countries of them in the last election. So, as you said, Stephen, at the at, at the outset, there are elections going on in a lot of countries right now, yep. and we're going to be seeing similar kinds of actors doing similar kinds of things. Yeah, it's a worldwide uh, matter. Yeah. 
Yep. And uh, I want to add just for many, many of, of, of your listeners, Steve, the readers of your books, that we talk about the New Apostolic Reformation now, but it has roots in cultic groups of the 1970s and 80s that were generally known as the Shepherding Discipleship Movement. Thank you. And the kinds of abuses that were going on then, you know, partly corrected, perhaps partly not, but many of the same people are still involved, are, have become leaders in the New Apostolic Reformation. People who were shepherds, like uh, oh, Dennis Peacock, comes mm -hmm. to mind as one important mm -hmm. shepherd who was politically active then, and oh, he's politically active mm -hmm. now, and in very similar kinds of ways. So there's a certain continuity. It's just that uh, things have uh, have become reorganized. Yep, right? relabeled. And I'll yeah. add, you know, I'm so glad you mentioned that because that when I started my work helping exit counsel people who are in all types of destructive cults, I did a lot of work with shepherding, discipling cults. And again, it's this issue of you can't have a relationship with Jesus directly. You need a discipler or a shepherd over you who you treat as if they were Jesus who you submit and obey completely, even to the point of going over your entire day mm -hmm. in 15-minute increments and reporting back and getting permission to even who you're going to date or if you can date or if you can kiss and who you can marry, etc. So this notion of submission and obedience to some human being who is the ultimate authority who's representing God is the key theme. And I'm really glad you, you brought mm -hmm. that up, uh, Fred. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, too, we talked earlier about uh, the, the change in church governance. I mean, most of the Protestant world, right, have, uh, elect their own leaders, mm -hmm. their own mm -hmm. you know, councils of elders yeah. or whatever they call yeah. them. They yeah. select their own pastors, right? Yep. That's out the window with apostolic governance. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Paula White Cain became the pastor, of the white pastor of an all black congregation mm -hmm. in Florida. And very, it, within a year, said, We're, we're now an apostolic ministry. Right. Yeah. And she, she and, her, and her family became the apostolic leaders of the congregation by fiat. Yeah. yeah. And this is what happens. And the, as bad as that is, the, tr the, the challenge, the, the tragedy for democracy is that these kinds of democratic religious congregations is where many people learn and practice democracy yes, in the yes, first place. Yes. You know, there are not, there are fewer and fewer institutions that are democratically organized, whether mm. they're nonprofit political groups or labor mm. unions. All these democratic institutions are, are uh, you know, becoming smaller. And so the people's opportunity to learn about Robert's Rules of Order, you know, how do you mm -hmm. run a meeting? How do you, mm -hmm. what, what does it mean to be an elected representative? Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of uh, practice and experience is, uh, is, is decreasing. And the, the, the New Apostolic Reformation is part of the leadership of decreasing that democratic mm -hmm. capacity. That, that's so important. In, yes. fact. in chapter two of my book, I talk about apostles as political uh, entrepreneurs, you see. And uh, I give it a, 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 a a case study of a church in Canada that went from a church to an apostolic and became an apostolic center, you see, and how they went through that process of going from a democratically run institution or, or congregation to one that is now led by an apostle. And there's transitions that that go this way, where democracy is is simply thrown out the window, and and so these these apostolic centers become incubators of dominion, yeah, and reproduce disciples. This is what it means to have apostles in the marketplace. They become training centers to make apostles in the marketplace go back into their own spheres of influence right. and exercise what they learned, yeah, in their apostolic center. Yeah, see. and infiltrate <laughs> uh, South America, Africa, all over the world. I want to come back to the, the democratic experiment. We didn't want to have a king. We wanted to have checks and balances <laughs> of power to, uh, to uh, minimize abuse of power. Mm -hmm. And what I'm hearing now are people who are in this mindset, we need a dictator. We, you know, we're, we don't mind if Trump wants to be a dictator and weaponize mm -hmm. the Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. 
because yeah. this will do you know because he's like a king cyrus figure so he yeah he'll do he'll do god's work for us yeah. and this is the opposite of what the entire <laughs> experiment of american democracy is about yes mm. well it's one really yeah. important point of that that is that we, that we we've talked about these things including that very kind of point but the New Apostolic Reformation is broader than that, right? There are some people who are definitely like that. They want a king-like figure, a King Cyrus, uh, the people who brought us January 6th, what the people we're talking about as Christian nationalists on the day. They were mostly NAR people. Mm -hmm. But there are parts of the NAR movement that think all that stuff is, uh, is, is dangerous and heretical and damaging to their movement. Hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it acts of vanity and egotism in exactly the way you would describe them, mm -hmm. Steve. And they they believe in uh, in many of the same same things, but uh, and they would like to see a uh, a theocratic Christian kind of governance, right? But they they're they're slow motion long term revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not necessarily big flamboyant big ego kinds of figures giving mm -hmm. big speeches on the mall. Their mm -hmm. their methodical approach to these things is in its own way just as dangerous. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. If we get past the current movement. Of, uh, of, uh, of the big flamboyant January 6 types, these guys are still going to be operating in this generation and the next. Now, mm -hmm. one of the leaders of this, of this faction is a guy named Joseph Matera, mm -hmm. who has a church in Brooklyn, New York, mm -hmm. right? Brooklyn. And, he's, uh, and he's, uh, uh, he was a top apostle, right, of the United States Coalition of Apostolic Leaders. He's not just an apostle of a network of followers. He's an apostle of apostles, mm. right? And he was one of the original signers of the Manhattan Declaration. Wow. So it, it's important to see these guys in, in uh, the kind of broader political context that they really are, as important as, uh, uh, as Dutch Sheets and Chuck Pierce and the mm -hmm. people on January 6th mm -hmm. are. These guys are just as important in their own way because they provided uh, the... the, the, the the intellectual, the, the, the infrastructure for everything that's happening. Right. Yeah, they're more Christian Reconstructionist, slow motion kind of patient change than the, you know, like what Fred is saying, this flamboyant turnover uh, from one thing to another very, very uh, quickly. Right. So I guess I want to come back to my expertise, which is a brainwashing, Chinese communist political brainwashing of the 50s. And we know that the government uh, has re-education programs with Uyghur Muslims wanting to make them good Ch uh, Han Chinese, etc. And from my perspective, ch and challenge me if you don't agree, but it seems to me like governments, state actors, and other people who really are about power want to use proxy groups that are religious, like the Moonies, to do their dirty work for them and cloak it as religious freedom. And you can't criticize religions because one person's cult is another person's religion. And there's this whole propaganda thing that I see happening uh, orchestrated by Scientology, the Moonies, Synanon was involved when Synanon was around back in the 70s to create this religious freedom cloak to cover basically political and financial enterprises. What do you think, Fred and Andre? Well, yeah, the idea of, uh, of uh, governmental leaders and political institutions, you know, wanting to... Uh, uh, own and control and manipulate and influence religion is nothing new. That, that's a given, you know, throughout history. And uh, what's, what, what's different in the case of, of, uh, of cultic kinds of groups, you know, is the, is the degree of control they exert within the group mm -hmm. and can therefore direct their political activities, mm -hmm. right? They become so soldiers to the politician. And we certainly saw that with the Shepherding Discipleship movement. A lot of the Pat Robertson political campaign was full of Shepherding Discipleship leaders. Right. And that's just how that goes. So because there's the controversial practices of, uh, of deprogramming and, you know, illegally and violently taking people out of their religious communities and saying, you're not going to believe that anymore, that becomes the tail that wags the dog. Right. Yeah, that was 76, 77. I was involved with helping people get out of the Moonies for one year. 
to this day, Scientology says that I'm an anti-religious bigot who does that, mm. which I decried oh, that. Sure. I mean, you, I mean, you did that, and you're sorry about that at that one mm. episode, but the idea of this one particular kind of approach, right? Yeah. Is used to define the entire question of, of cults and control, right? Mm. And you don't see any of the people that are concerned about these things, concerned about the violence and, uh, and crimes that are committed against their own members by abusing their own power. Yes. I've yet to hear a single person concerned about these things speak about these kinds of internal reforms that were needed. If they were authentic critics, they would be concerned about the entire human experience Great point. in you know, a tightly controlled religious groups. So is, does religious freedom right, give you the right to abuse and control others? Or is religious freedom about liberating the conscience so people can make their own decisions? Mm. And yeah. love and compassion yeah. and charity yeah. and yeah. and being open-minded uh, is another mm -hmm. critical thing that has yeah. helped the human species to evolve rather than going, I know the truth and I'm not going to be open yeah. to thinking in any other way than what I've been exactly. taught. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, fundamentalism runs against that kind of stuff, even without a specific cultic kind of set of practices. Mm -hmm. But uh, so there's sort of a, a continuum, if you will, Steve, you know, of these yes. kinds of mm -hmm. things. But traditional Baptist views hold that, it, you know, it's the right of individual conscience. You have your own relationship with mm -hmm. God. And the most important single thing is you need to ha come to your own decision. Right. right. Yeah. Without uh, some uh, clerical intermediary, without some powerful go government institution telling you what to do. The Baptists, you know, more than anybody else originated the idea of separation of church and state mm -hmm. because it was the purpose of separation of church and state is to protect the right of individual yeah. conscience to make their own decisions. Right. And I need to right. come back to you, Andre, because you were a pastor in an NAR, decided to study the Bible, became a scholar, and you teach Bible. And mm -hmm. I believe you have a YouTube where you are teaching mm -hmm. You know, what does the Bible say and what is the context and how do we do proper, you know, theological yeah. evaluations? Yeah, no, no, for sure. Uh, yeah, I had I, I was a pastor for several years. We adopted we weren't a, a, maybe an official NAR, but mm. we adopted a lot of the ideas of the NAR. So mm -hmm. Wagner would have probably said, OK, if he knew us, oh, OK, you're part of the NAR. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, but yes, when I, I started going to university, I started looking at all of these questions uh, from an academic perspective, uh, things that I have never learned in my own context. You right. see, we were just reading the Bible for what it was. We were never asking very much anything in terms of historical questions on how the Bible came about. Uh, what does it mean? How do we interpret scripture? How was scripture interpreted through time? You see the reception, the the reception of scripture. That means the interpretation of the Bible through time. Yes. How that shapes the way people read the Bible today. How are our own experience shape the way uh, we read the Bible today? I, I've never learned about that. So, but in university, they give you tools to be able to make those critical uh, those critical analysis and contextualize scripture. So this is why some it, it's, in a sense, my primary uh, scholarly training is biblical scholarship. Mm -hmm. And this is why I was interested in what was happening with these uh, neo-charismatic Pentecostal NAR people and how they use the Bible to legitimize a lot of what they believe and a lot of the, the things that they do. And my goal is to kind of maybe help people see, but you see the way that he's using this text, uh, if you really put it in the context of where this text finds itself, that's actually not what it means. <laughs> it <laughs> exactly. actually means com often very, very something very, very contrary to what you just uh, say, or you're just taking a part of the Bible to make it what it means, and 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 you know, like these Christians, and and we talk about this a lot, uh, how they use so much of the uh, Hebrew Bible or what Christians call the Old Testament, or we and call how the they Torah, use, or the Torah, <laughs> and what they use as, uh, you know, they they constantly refer to war, uh, violent narratives, 
uh, you know, battles of Jericho, destruction of, by through genocide and all of that. They yeah, use a lot of these. Mostly Deuteronomy, I believe. Yeah, yeah, and and they use a lot of these stories mm -hmm. without necessarily going back to how the early Christians, when they read these stories, did not read them literally. Right. That they had developed a new hermeneutic, a new way of understanding these stories in light of their Christian faith, that we're on a different field, a playing field. So the thing is, they're not taking all of this into account. They're yeah. just going to these texts and say, hey, we got to do this. And people and forget you, that there's rabbinic interpretation exactly, for thousands exactly, of years exactly, that we don't. That's it. That's the it, same that's word it, for a it, man exactly, sleeping with a man is it. used for shellfish, but that's that you don't that's see it. any of these folks that, not eating yeah, yeah. shrimp or lobster. That's, that's it. So you, that's it. So that's I think I see my job a bit as, as doing that too. Yes. You know, kind of helping people realize that you know how the Bible is used. Uh, Fantastic. You be careful. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen, so much. We're going to wrap up now. Final yep. words to you, Fred, and then to you, Andre, and then we'll sign off. Well, sure. And in, in light of what uh, you guys were just talking about. The way that NAR leaders are, are speaking to their followers now is that uh, they're asking them to think of themselves as biblical warriors mm -hmm. yeah. modeled on uh, Joshua or David or Esther, right? And, and uh, they, they cast themselves that way too. Mm -hmm. the, this, this isn't just a metaphorical kind of thing, looking for inspiration from a superhero. No, you're fighting the, uh, the same kind of battle you know, and in the same way, and the, facing the same kind of demonic enemies, on, and under God's direction, through his apostles and prophets, this is what your mission and role is in this time. Right. And they even yeah. use a shofar, the ram's horn, yeah. Uh, yeah, to, to try to give legitimacy yeah. to their yeah. perspective. Andre, your, your, your wrap yes, up. Yes, yes. Thank you, uh, Steve, for this time. Uh, again, I think it's important to if you want to learn more about uh, the NAR and uh, the, you know, what they believe, what, how they <laughs> act. <laughs> uh, For I, those I on the podcast, you. we're holding yeah. up Andre's book. Yes, and you can look yes. at the video uh, on my please, website. Please, uh, please buy the book and uh, give it uh, your rating if you can on Amazon. And uh, I think you'll learn a lot through this. It's not complicated Definitely. as a book. It's not long. You can read it easily in two hours. That's great. Thank you, <laughs> gentlemen, so much. Take Thank care. Thank you. Thank you, you for having you. us. Thank you. Steve Hassan here. You know, it's been decades since my family rescued me from the Moonies. I've been at this for over 47 years. The need has never been greater. If you're able, please consider hitting the super thanks button below and it'll help us to do better. Every penny will help us toward our goal of educating the planet about undue influence. Remember, it's your mind, only you should control it.